ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما Amma ba'd. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran a story that occurred between Musa and Khidr alayhi salam. And this occurs in Surah Al-Kahf. And it is a surah that many of us read frequently, especially on Friday. And it is a story that has a lot of benefits and a lot of wisdom for us. And there's only one time in the whole Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala references Khidr. Even though the reference is indirect, but not by name, but by story. <coughs> and Khidr alayhi uh, salam, we learn from our tradition that Khidr was a prophet of Allah. That Khidr was a prophet of Allah. And this is in contrast to what some people believe, which is superstitious belief, to be honest, that Khidr is some type of superhuman, that he's flying around, he's still alive. No, all of this is fairy tales. Khidr was a prophet. And Musa was a prophet. And the two of them were sent to two different people, but at the same time on earth. And we learn in Surah Al-Kahf that one time, uh, this our Prophet ﷺ told us that Musa alayhi salam spoke and gave a khutbah to the people. And someone asked him, Oh Musa, who's the most knowledgeable person on earth? Who's the greatest person of knowledge? And so Musa assumed that he was the most knowledgeable. And honestly, why would he not assume? Allah has spoken to him directly. He is one of the greatest prophets, Ulul Azmi min al-Rusul. He has the largest ummah that has humanity has ever seen up until his time. Our ummah is larger, but up until his time, it was the largest ummah. Allah Azza wa Jal chose him, spoke to him directly. Mount Tu, Sayna. Why shouldn't he assume? So he made an assumption, and he said, "I am the most knowledgeable." Immediately, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala sent Jibril down and said to him, "O oh Musa, how could you speak without knowledge?" How could you say something you didn't know? You just made an assumption. You can't just speak about the religion like this. You can't speak about ilm al ghayb Verily, there is a servant of ours, Abd min ibadina. We have given him knowledge that you do not have. He has some knowledge you don't have. How can you make this claim that you are the most knowledgeable? So immediately, Musa alayhi salam humbled himself and he said, Oh Allah, give me permission to go meet this person. Allow me to go study with him. And this shows us his humility and humbleness. That being who he was, he had no qualms instantaneously lowering himself for the sake of knowledge. And such is the case. We accept the truth from anyone. We learn and study from any person who has more knowledge than us. No matter what their ethnicity, no matter what their age, no matter what their background. When a person is a person of knowledge, instantaneously we'll humble ourselves in front of their knowledge as Musa alayhi salam demonstrated. So he asked Allah permission. Allah azza wa said, go and meet him in such and such a place. And these are, the, uh, these are the characteristics. And the story mentions when you will meet him when the fish disappears. The story of Surah Al-Kahf mentions. So eventually Musa meets Khidr. And he asks Khidr and he says to Khidr, let me follow you so that I can learn some of your knowledge. Let me gain some of this knowledge. Khidr says, You won't have patience to be with me. You don't have enough patience to be with me. Musa says, give me a try. Give me a try. I'll listen to you. So Khidr says, I only have one condition. If you accompany me, don't ask me what I'm doing until I tell you. Don't interfere. Don't get involved. It's not your job. I have a mission. I'm going to do it. You mind your own business until I tell you and I explain to you. Until I do that, you're not allowed to ask and question. So Musa says, okay, we will do that. Not a problem. Then they find a ship. And this ship belonged to some poor fishermen. And they needed to come across the side. They wanted to go across and get to the other side. 
And they said to the people of the ship, they said to the fishermen, will you carry us uh, and Allah Azza wa Jal will reward you. We don't have any money. We don't have any. Can you just carry us, get to the other side and Allah Azza wa Jal will bless you. So the fishermen were generous. They said, no problem, come with us. We'll take you to the other side. When they were busy casting their nets and fishing, Khidr comes down into the hull of the ship, pulls out an ax and he cracks the hull of the ship just enough to let the water in so that they could make it to safety without drowning. Just enough so that the water begins to flood, they make it to safety to drowning. And as the fishermen are confused, what happened? Where did this water come from? In the confusion, Musa and Khidr just disappear. Musa says to Khidr, how could you have done this to these people when they were so generous to us? They gave us for free, they gave us a lift and a ride. Why did you do this to them? And Khidr says, didn't I tell you, you don't have patience? Musa says, I forgot. And he genuinely forgot. He says, Okay, you know, I forgot. This is a genuine mistake. And when you make a genuine mistake, you're supposed to overlook it. Don't give me a tough time because I forgot. You're right, I made a mistake. I won't do it again. Barely has he finished the sentence. And the axe is still fresh with the wounds of the hull. And now they come across some kids playing on the shore. And Khidr takes one of them and eliminates one. Musa has not forgotten. He has just said, I haven't for, I have, I'm not going to do it again. He knows exactly what the condition is. But the taking of a life is a very big deal. Especially the life of an innocent. Especially the life of a young child. Musa, knowing full well what the condition was, became so angry. How could you have taken an innocent life? And this shows us, by the way, that Khidr was a prophet. Because nobody on earth has the right to be judge, jury, executioner, except for someone whom Allah Azza wa Jal has told directly, and this means a prophet. No one can use this excuse, say, oh Allah told me to do it, unless they're a prophet. Khidr was a prophet, and Musa was a prophet. So Khidr does the deed, Musa becomes irritated. Khidr says to him, look, didn't I just tell you? You see for yourself, you don't have enough patience. And Musa did not forget, he doesn't have an excuse, so he has only one thing to say. He says, okay, you know what, you're right, but I ask for one more chance. Basically, three strikes and I'm out. One more chance, allow me. Our Prophet said, may Allah, have Musa, may Allah have mercy on Musa. Had he not been hasty and put that condition on himself, he would have seen many amazing things. Had he not been hasty, he was hasty. He wanted to show, okay, you're right. Had he not been hasty, and our Prophet ﷺ said, hastiness is from shaitan. And he said, thinking and acting calmly is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hastiness is from shaitan, being very quick to act. They're just acting impulsively. This is, this is not from the characteristics of the believer. And acting thoughtfully, and acting with much uh, patience in what you're doing, this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Musa became irritated, he said, you know what, one more time, khalas, I'll leave you. You won basically. So the two of them, they make their way to a village, they're tired, they're hungry. Notice by the way, they're both prophets. Subhanallah, they have no money because they're not interested in this dunya. Their pockets are not overflowing with gold and silver. They didn't have money to pay the fishermen. Now they're hungry, night has fallen, they don't have money for food. And it was the custom of the time, the custom of the world, and this is our Islamic custom as well to this day, that when a stranger comes to your town and village, that, that stranger has the right for some basic hospitality, basic bread and a cup of water. This is fard, kifaya, that the community has to take care of a stranger that has no other means. You're not going to let a person starve. And this was the culture of that time. This was how it worked. This was how everything worked. Everybody understood this. This city or this town was so miserly and stingy, they refused to share a cup of water and a loaf of bread with these strangers. I mean, the height of stinginess. They refused to be the least bit hospitable. And in fact, they mocked them, they pelted them, they got rid of them, say, get out of here, go, shoo, go away. And these are the greatest prophets together, and the community treats them in this manner. And so as they walk out, and you can imagine Musa was one who had a temper, you can imagine how he's feeling, frustrated, tired, hungry. And on top of this, this rude treatment, Khidr stops, and he repairs the wall of the town. Every town had a wall for safety. He repairs the wall of the town. And Musa, again, he didn't forget. He knows full well, but his irritation got the better of him. 
Musa says the least you could have done is to get some food for what you have done. You have made this wall perfectly fine. The least you could have done, لَتَّخَطَّ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا Get some money, get some ajr, get some food, get something for us that they have treated us in this manner and instead you are hospitable back to them. So Khidr says to him, your condition was three strikes and you're out, this is it. هَذَا فِرَاقُ بَيْنِي وَبَيْنِكَ Khalas, we're gonna go our separate ways. This was your condition. I didn't say this. You said it, so so be it. As you said it shall be done. هذا فراق بيني وبينك. سأنبئك بتأويل ما لم تستطع عليه صبرا. Now I shall tell you what you had no patience to understand. And in this stories, by the way, there is extreme relevance for every single one of us sitting here. Every one of these stories, they are stories that we come across. In different ways, in different formats, but the same musibahs afflict all of us. The same trials happen to all of us. So let us understand some of the wisdoms that those trials Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down. As for the safina, as for the ship, Khidr says it belonged to a group of poor people, poor fishermen, poor people, and there was a tyrannical king that was confiscating every single usable ship. So there must have been a war going on, he wants some ships for his navy, so he doesn't care, he just goes and confiscates everybody's ship. And so, by putting this hole in the ship, the king comes, he finds the ship is not in service, he simply overlooks it and confiscates everybody else's ship. By putting that damage in the ship, I in fact saved the ship for the Masakin. Notice as well here, brothers and sisters, that the Masakin were not told much details about them, the poor people. But we learn one thing, they were generous. After all, they let people ride for free. And so, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? They showed their generosity through the ship. Allah preserved the vehicle of their generosity. That which you're generous with, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will preserve for you. If you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put barakah in your money, put barakah in your time, put barakah in your life, use it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be generous with it. And Allah will preserve your wealth if you spend for His cause, like He preserved the wealth of the fishermen when they spent of it. That was their wealth, that's all they had. And when they used it to be generous, what did Allah do? The very act of generosity became their salvation. The very act of being good to others, Allah used it to save their ship. Also notice as well, can you imagine the frustration that the fishermen would have felt when they saw their ship had been damaged? Can you imagine the anger they would have felt when they realized those two people that we put on the ship, they're the ones who caused that damage. Can you imagine? Put yourselves in their shoes. Now, Imagine them seeing the king confiscate the ship of their friends and the ship of their co-workers and the ship of every single fisherman in the entire city except their ship. How would their frustration instantaneously flip over to what? Alhamdulillah Allah sent somebody to destroy our ship. Look, because they were being short-sighted, because they're only looking for the next five minutes, they don't realize there's a wisdom they don't know about. They don't realize, put your trust in Allah, this musibah is saving you from a bigger musibah. This calamity is protecting you from a much bigger calamity. If only you put your trust in Allah and you realize, look, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking care of me and Allah knows how to take care of me. I don't understand. I don't understand why the ship is damaged. Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakeel. Inna lillahi wa nail raji'oon. Allah is going to take care of us. If only they had patience, right? They would have understood. But we are, as a creatures, as a species, we are so impatient. We don't understand. Next time you have some financial loss, next time you're in a car accident, next time a damage happens, next time any musibah happens, remember the story of the fisherman. Remember the story of the fisherman. Put your trust in Allah. If you are truly generous and you're a good person, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use these smaller trials to protect you from much larger trials. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that whatever happened wasn't worse. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the right to do as He pleases. Give us patience, O Allah, and make the situation better for us. That's the attitude of the believer. And we learn it from the case of the fisherman. The child, 
the death of the child. Subhanallah, every parent here knows that the most traumatic thing that can occur to any human is to lose his child. Wallahi, there's nothing more painful than to lose your own child. Every parent here will give himself and herself up a thousand times before they want their own child to die. This is human nature. Allah created us this manner. And can you imagine the pain and the suffering that those parents would have felt that day when they get the news that the child has been killed in a mad rage. They have no clue. Even now, when we are so used to and immune to death, still when a tragedy afflicts a child, as what happened in Newton, Connecticut, Newtown, Connecticut, a few months ago, when that tragedy happened, it shook us to the core and it should shake us to the core. Can you imagine in those times when this never happened? You didn't have mass murders. You didn't have crazy people just killing kids everywhere. Can you imagine the trauma of those parents? But Khidr explains and he says, those two people, they were righteous people. Mu'minaini. They were good people. They were believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah knew that this child would grow up. In fact, I said the worst thing is to have a child that dies. You know, there's actually one thing that is worse than that. To have a living child whose heart is spiritually dead. To have an ungrateful, arrogant child who continues to stab you as his parents, who continues to mock you, who continues to look down and belittle you. In fact, this is worse than a death that at a young age that you have sweet memories, you have good times of the child. This is worse than that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knew that this child would grow up to be arrogant. Tughyanan wa kufra. He would be somebody who looks down at his parents. He would be the height of disobedience. So what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? فَأَرَادَ رَبُّكَ So your Lord wanted that he substitutes this child for a better child. To give a better child that shall be good to them, that shall be thankful to them, that shall be loyal to them. And so they got the best of both worlds. They had a child with beautiful memories, that child was taken away. And then Allah gave them a child with memories and with a future as well. Next time a calamity happens, next time a musibah happens, next time you lose a, a loved one, realize never does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take one blessing away except that He gives you a better blessing in its place. This is a rule. This is a rule in our religion. It is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has sunnahs as well. Allah has sunnahs as well. This is the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That when He takes something away that you wanted, that you desire, that was a comfort to you, and you have faith in Him. Because look, the parents, mu'minain, the parents were believers, they were good people, they were righteous people. When you have true faith in Allah, never does Allah take something away except that He gives something better in its place. All you need to do is have faith. All you need to do is to have tawakkul in Allah, trust in Allah. Know that Allah loves you more than you love yourself, more than your mother loves you, as our Prophet said. When you're dealing with an entity who loves you more than your mother, how come you just let go and say, Allah, you know best? You know best. Oh Allah, give me the patience to overcome this and give me something better than this. We learned this from the story of the second of the three incidents. And the final incident, the final incident, Khidr tells him that this portion of the wall, it's behind a garden. And this garden belongs to Yatimain, two orphans. It belongs to two orphans. وَكَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا And their father was a righteous man. Salih. He was a righteous man. The father has died. And he's buried treasure for his children. And that treasure happens to be above this wall. If the wall collapsed and the treasure is revealed, if the townspeople didn't give me a glass of water, do you think they would have given the orphans the gold? So, I repatched the wall until the orphans become strong men. They can now defend themselves. And then they will find the, 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 the gold when they are most in need of it. Because when do you really need the money? You need it when you're young, when you're, when you're starting a family, when you're starting your career. This is when you need it. Not when you're five years old. When you're becoming a young man and a young adult, this is the money will become beneficial and you can protect your own money. Now, 
put yourselves in the shoes of those orphans and their mother. She will be begging Allah, making dua, where is the money, where is the rizq? How am I going to survive? And Allah knows, if He were to answer her dua right then and there, and reveal to her the money right then and there, she sees it, oh, here's the money. What's going to happen? Immediately the money will be confiscated, will be taken away, and her dua was answered, but it wasn't answered. By delaying the response of the dua for 15, 20 years, Allah knows how long. By delaying the response of the dua, what happens? She got the money when she needed it the most. Allah knows when to respond to your du'as. Allah knows, you don't know, I don't know. Allah knows when it is the best to give you what you're asking for. But as long as you're asking and you are sincere, you will get what you need or something better than that. This is our promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also notice here, two things that we learn from the second and third story. In the second story, the parents were righteous, Allah did not want them to have an unrighteous son. So He took away the unrighteous son and He gave them a righteous son. In the third story, the father was righteous and he died an early death. So Allah took care of the finances of those children. Parents, listen to me very carefully. Parents, listen to me very carefully. You want your children to be religious? You want your children to be good to you? You want your children to be forbearing, to be patient, to be birrul walidain? The story has it. Start with yourself before you start with them. If you are good, Allah says they're going to be good. This is the story. What are we learning from it? The second story. The parents were good. So what happens? They got good children. Look at this. The, the parents were mu'minayn. Allah did not want to give them kafirayn because they're mu'minayn. You want your son and daughter to be good to you? You had better be good in your own personal private private life. You had better have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the number one way to ensure that your children will be righteous to you. The third story tells us what? Every one of us want to take care of our children, send them to Ivy League colleges, want them to have the best education. We're going to bend over backwards to make sure we have the most rizq for them. What does this story teach us? The number one way to get your children money once again, كَانَ أَبُوهُمَا صَالِحًا His father was a good man. Allah took care of the kids. His father was a good man. So money just came and they had no idea where it came from. Deen and dunya, this world and the next, it is given when you have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when you don't have that relationship, you neither get this world nor do you get the next. These three stories, brothers and sisters, it teaches us many things, but the fundamental point that I want every one of us to go away with. The fundamental point is what? When you have a good relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even your problems and musibas are in fact blessings in disguise. The, 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 the believer is never punished for the sake of pure punishment. Anything that happens to the believer is in fact for the benefit of the believer and therefore have iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this world and the next will be given to you barakallahu wa lakum fuqaran azim wa nafa'ani wa iyaakum bima fihim al ayati wa dhikr al hakim aqulu ma tasma'un wa astaghfirullah azim li wa lakum lisa'i muslimin min kulli dhamin fa astaghfiruhu innahu huwa al ghafur rahim may ask the brothers to move forward because we have uh, people coming in so please move forward as much as you can الحمد لله الواحد الأحد الصمد الذي لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد وبعد Somebody might ask that doesn't the Quran say that every musibah that happens to you is because of the sins that you have done? Allah says in the Quran وَمَا أَصَابَكُمْ مِمُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ Every musibah that you do, every calamity that befalls you, every pain, every suffering, it is because of your own sins. And yet my entire khutbah, the first half of it has been, it's not, a, it's not a calamity, it's a blessing in disguise. How do we reconcile this? The response, finish the ayah. Don't just quote half the ayah. Finish the ayah. What does Allah say in the Quran? وَمَا أَصَابَكُم مِّن مُصِيبَةٍ فَبِمَا كَسَبَتْ أَيْدِيكُمْ وَيَعْفُوا عَنْ كَثِيرٍ Through these trials, Allah forgives much of your sins. The purpose of trials and tribulations on the believer is to raise his ranks up. 
The purpose of trials and tribulations on the believer is to reward him in this world and the next. And therefore, even a calamity for the believer is not a full calamity, it is a blessing in disguise. It is to prevent a bigger calamity as we have seen in all of these three stories. Now how do you know whether what's happening to you is actually just uh, uh, something to save you from a bigger calamity or in fact it is a genuine punishment? The response is very simple. Look at your own reaction to a calamity. Look at your own response to a trial and tribulation. Any time a trial afflicts you, any time you're in suffering and grief, any time some problem happens and it causes you to come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you increase your dua. You increase your dhikr, you give charity, you're always conscious of Allah, you're conscious of your own sins, you're conscious of all of this. Then wallahi brothers and sisters, whatever has happened to you is a blessing. Because anything that brings you closer to Allah, it is a blessing no matter what the cost is. No matter what the cost is to come closer to Allah, you have won a fortune that is worth everything of this world. Everything of this world can be sacrificed, but not your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anything that brings you closer to Allah, then know that that calamity is a blessing, even if you don't realize it. You just don't know. You're looking five minutes ahead. You don't know the next hour. You don't know the next day. You don't know the next 20 years. Allah knows. If you have true faith in Allah, this calamity is a blessing. You just don't realize it. However, if this calamity causes you to distance yourself from Allah. You turn your back on the religion. Arrogance comes to you and you say, oh, why is this happening to me? I gave $5,000 in the fundraiser last year. A'udhu Billah, do you listen to this? You think you're gonna bribe Allah with $5,000? You think Allah needs you and your worship? If anybody feels that they don't deserve any type of musibah, then wallahi, that attitude shows that they deserve the worst musibah. The arrogance to put your judgments against Allah. I don't deserve this. Who are you to judge what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does? The very fact that you feel so arrogant that you can comment on Allah's qadr, it shows that you really don't have iman because the essence of iman is to humble yourself in front of Allah. So the mu'min who humbles himself in front of Allah and he understands Allah knows and I don't know. And Allah knows why this is happening. I'll put my faith and trust in Allah. Oh Allah, you have a wisdom. Give me patience to overcome this. Give me ajr and reward to overcome this. Substitute something better. Alleviate my pain. Anytime something brings you closer to Allah, Alhamdulillah, this is good news. And it is news that you're on the right path. Everybody's going to be tested and tried. Even the prophets were tested and tried. Nobody has a rosy life. Everybody is tested and tried. So if those trials bring you your iman higher, that's good news. And if you find that your iman withers, if you find that your relationship with Allah is destroyed because of worldly calamities, then wallahi, this is time for you to pause and rethink things through. Time for you to make sure before death comes, you have a different relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters in Islam, these three stories, they teach us that Qadr is real. And this is what we believe. We believe in the six pillars of Iman and the sixth of these pillars is what? And tu'mina bil qadari khayrihi wa sharrihi. You believe in Qadr, the good and the bad. Qadr is real. And one of the benefits for us Muslims who believe in Qadr, one of the greatest thamaras, one of the greatest fruits of believing in Qadr is that when everything has been decreed and Allah knows what is going to happen, if you truly have faith in Allah, let yourself go. He'll take care of you. Let all of these musibas go. Allah will take care of you. Put your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that what is happening is happening for the best. Have a positive attitude. Realize that the greatest blessing is the blessing of Iman. Everything else is secondary. Wallahi, not even secondary. It's irrelevant. If you have Allah, you don't need anything else. And if you don't have Allah, then Wallahi, all that you have is meaningless. The one who has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wins this world and the next. The one who does not, 
He has nothing to show. His purpose, his life is entirely purposeless to live. And what he will face will be much worse than this. Brothers and sisters in Islam, I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes us to be of those who when a calamity happens, when a musibah happens, our iman goes up, our faith increases, our dua is even more passionate, our sajdas go higher, our sadaqah and zakah is even more generous. This is the sign of a believer. And I seek refuge from those who when a calamity happens, their arrogance goes up and their religiosity goes down and their faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shaken. Allahumma inni da'in fa'amminu. Allahumma la ta'da'na fi hadhi yawmi dhamban illa ghafarta wa la hamman illa farrajta wa la daynan illa qadayta wa la maridan illa shafayta wa la asiran illa yassarta. Allahumma afrin lana wa li ikhwanina alladhina sabakuna bil iman wa la taj'a fi qulubina ghillan lilladhina amanu. Rabbana inna ka raufur rahim. Allahumma a'izza al-islam wa al-muslimin. Allahumma a'izza al-islam wa المسلمين اللهم أعز الإسلام والمسلمين اللهم من أرادنا أو أراد الإسلام والمسلمين بالسوء فأشغله بنفسه واجعل تدميره في تدبيره يا قوي يا عزيز عباد الله إن الله تعالى أمركم بأمر بدأ به بنفسه وثنى بملائكة قدسه وثلث بكم أيها المؤمنون من جنه وإنسه فقال عز من قائل عليما إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك وأنعم على عبدك ورسولك محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين عباد الله إن الله تعالى يأمر بالعدل والإحسان ويتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون اذكروا الله العظيم يذكركم واشكروه يزد لكم ولذكر الله تعالى أكبر وأقم الصلاة